Welcome to the Dr. Pat Show. Thank you, Nick Johnson, for creating that music for us. Like, I don't even know how long ago. Um, I want to thank all of you for tuning us in and turning us on. We've got a great lineup here today. Hello, Benny. Hello, Jacob. How you both be, my producers, today? Hey, how's it going? Good, yeah. Pat. Yeah, yeah. You, you know, Benny, you've heard me talk about, and maybe Jacob, a little bit, but I've always been fascinated with, how should I call them? Ancient, absolutely ancient historical messaging. And how did that even happen? And here's a short story to tell you about my interest and my guest today. Sometimes we're drawn to things in life and we don't really know why. We don't, it doesn't, it kind of doesn't make sense on paper. Things just, you know, maybe as a kid, somebody points to you and says, hey, Robert, you're going to be that person. You're going to be that one. You're, that's you. Or Benny, you're going to be that. Or Jacob, you're going to be that. But here was a clue for me. And that's what today's show is about. Forgotten civilizations, new discoveries in the solar-induced dark age with Robert, Dr. Robert M. Schock. Now, here's why I find this interesting. And, and when, Linda, when Linda presented the book to me, I said, I've got to talk to him. And I hope I, I just hope I do justice to the discoveries and the questions and having us think in, in a sense, from a common sense perspective in a lot of ways. But here's the thing. I'm in a business program in Fairleigh Dickinson in New Jersey. And I had to take a elective. And I picked geology. It is absolutely not what a business person picks. You just don't do it. You don't pick geology when they say, oh, you want to take an elective. You just go to get something else over here. But you don't pick geology. And I walk into the geology classroom, fantastically amazing. I was like a kid in a candy store and I knew nothing about it. So here, here's a really long story, really short. The first thing out of the professor's mouth was, how many of you want to be geology majors? So everybody except like five of us. How many of you are here because somebody told you you had to be here? So we all raise our hands. Mistake number one, if somebody asks you a question in college, are you here because somebody made you be here? Do not answer yes. That is not good. But here's what happened to me. It was the hardest class I have, had ever taken. It was the most interesting course I had ever taken. And if my business would have paid for me to continue to study, I would have done it throughout my entire undergraduate. But they didn't. But here's what I love about this. We go on a field trip and I'm just loving this. I am like, I don't even know what I'm looking at. We're going to do, we're, we're looking at fossils. We're looking at rock formations. We're looking at minerals. We're looking at all of these things. And I'm not different than probably you all out there that has been fascinated by what we don't fully understand but intuitively want to know more about. That's what I love about Robert today joining me. So, Professor says, you ready, Robert? Wait I'm for ready. it. I'm here. Wait for it. The person in the class, the first person, two teachers, they compete against each other each year for like a case of champagne. So the student that finds pyrite first in each class gets an automatic A. And the, and the teacher gets a case of something. I don't even know what it was. Guess who finds the pyrite within 10 minutes of a field trip? I would guess you. You had to know that from the faculty's perspective, <laughs> he couldn't have been happier. 
but at the same time, he was shocked. And I've often thought about this. And, you know, as I was reading your book and I was thinking about you and your journey, I got to ask you with this question coming out of the gate. You know, you're a tenured faculty member at Boston uh, University. I took one course there when I was, was when I moved up there. Um, you have a doctorate in geology. You have written books about one of my favorite fascinations. Some people call it the Sphinx. Some people call it other things. But as time goes on, you've studied, you've researched ancient civilizations. I got to ask you, what was your pyrite moment? What was that moment for you where you popped up and say, hey, I'm going to be this for the rest of my life? <laughs> Oh, <laughs> well, that's a, that's very funny because I'm not sure I've said I'm going to be this for the rest of my life quite yet <laughs> when it comes right down to it. But I will tying in with what you were just talking about. Uh, I was not a geology major for my first few weeks in college. I was going to be an art history major. I loved art. I still love art. I love art history. I was actually going to major in art history. Uh, with a focus on late antiquity at that time. I knew exactly what I wanted to do. Of course, these things changed very, very quickly. And I had to take a science elective. So what did I do? I took geology. I didn't just take geology, but this was me. I took the major introductory geology course because I figured if I was going to take something, I might as well take the real thing, not the watered down dilute version. And I fell in love with geology. And I can tell you why I fell in love with geology because not all the questions were answered. Right. And I had a wonderful faculty member who from day one uh, intro geology course was very explicit when he didn't really know something. He said he didn't really understand how these rocks form, et cetera. It wasn't his ignorance, it's because no one understood. And I remember one time, I have to say this, where he was going on and on about how he really didn't understand how this certain set of metamorphic rocks were formed and it could be this or it could be that. And he almost was like, if you didn't know what was going on, that this person, well, does he really know what he's talking about? <laughs> but he absolutely knew what he was talking about because then when you went home and read the assigned chapter in the textbook, guess who the expert on those rocks were, were, you know, was? It was him. He was talking about one of his fields of expertise that he was acknowledged internationally you know, for in the geological community. So I just find, found that fascinating that there was more to learn, that this was a subject where people could actually admit we don't know everything there is to know. Because in so many introductory courses, they're taught as if all the answers are there. You just memorize the dogma and that's it. So I think that really had a great influence on me more than anything else, that there are so many things we don't know. You know what I'm fascinated by? Thank you so much for that, Robert. For those of you out there, if you're just tuning in, I am so thrilled to have Dr. Robert Schock joining me here today. You know, we're talking about forgotten civilizations, but we're also talking about another fascination of mine. There's so many and so little, I know so little about them. That's why anytime I get to have a conversation with you, Robert, I am just like a kid in a candy store. Um, but here's another intuitive thing I want to talk about. There are many people, if, they, if you ask them passing on the street, do you think the sun is stable or not stable? I'm just saying, try this. It is phenomenal. I did this about 10 years ago, way back. And I don't know why I did it. Some movie came out and I don't know. But if you ask people that question, at least when I asked them, their answer was so clear unstable. We think it's unstable. And yet, there's this general idea, or at least what I'm picking up is in the sciences, that we're now just starting to gather information that says not as stable as we thought. And this is a body of work for you, because solar induced dark age, and I want to talk with you about this. But what has been your journey in not just understanding the activity of the sun, 
But what led you down the pathway to say, wait a minute, solar outburst, electrical plasma, uh, down the pathway to say there's more here, here? Well, it really goes, this really goes back to my early work. My early work started out with the Sphinx, I think as maybe you know, and many people uh, know, and the redating of the Sphinx to ultimately, I kept pushing it back based on more and more data, ultimately to back to the end of the last ice age. And what I found, and this ties in with the solar induced dark age, is that there was what I call a cycle of civilization. There was true civilization, back at the end of the last ice age. The ice age ended, we know this very specifically now, geologically from sediment cores, ice cores, et cetera, it ended 9,700 BC. So just think in terms of about 12,000 years ago and what brought that down? It literally happened overnight. As far as we can tell, it may literally have been happened overnight. We can pinpoint to within a few weeks, uh, but that's just because of the lack of resolution down to days uh, in the ice cores in particular from Greenland. So what happened to it? What could bring this about? This was really perplexing. Different people have suggested different catastrophic scenarios. Uh, one that's very popular is a comet, but that would not end an ice age. It would actually throw an ice age um, back colder. Uh, all the evidence. There's also not evidence. We can talk about comets later. I've written about comets in previous books, but it was really trying to figure out what could cause the end of the last ice age. That was my initial impetus. And I had been studying the Sphinx. I was studying a site in Turkey known as Gebekli Tepe. Oh. Which goes back to 12,000 years, incredibly sophisticated. I believe they had writing, they had megalithic architecture, all the distinguishing features that scientists, that archeologists use to recognize true civilization. And to put this into context, because not everyone is um, into all the academia minutia. <laughs> um, the classic historians, the classic archeologists do not generally accept that civilization arose before about 4,000 to 3,000 BC. So when we're pushing it back to approximately 10,000 BC, that's 6,000 years earlier. But there is this time gap between the collapse of the that early cycle of civilization and the reemergence of civilization 6,000 years later. So that's what Katie, Katie is my wife, and I have been calling the solar-induced dark age. So what brought us to the sun? What brought me to the sun? It was another revelation. And this one really was due to Katie, my wife. We had gone to Turkey to study Gebekli Tepe, this incredibly sophisticated site, which confirmed my earlier work that there was true civilization 12,000 years ago. We went to Easter Island. We were actually married on Easter Island. This is wow. 2010. And something that Easter Island has is the Rongo Rongo script. Now the Rongo Rongo script looks like these little hieroglyphs, these little dancing characters. And something that I had been looking into but not paid enough attention to was the work of Los Alamos plasma physicists and plasma is basically ionized gases that can be given off by stars like the sun in what are known as solar outbursts, coronal mass ejections. And this is Dr. Anthony Parat. And he had found is that when you have these big solar outbursts, and he had been studying this and modeling this at the laboratory, you will see things in the sky, like the aurora borealis, the northern lights or the southern lights, but much more distinctive, much more definitive. It'll look like dancing figures in the sky, sort of think of stick figures or, or sets of uh, cascading donuts, that type of thing. It'll make very distinctive figures in the sky. And he had found that ancient people recorded this as petroglyphs. 
carvings on rock, what look like to some people scratchings on rock, but around the world, very distinctive. In fact, he's even commented, well, how could they know about this? It took me, you know, took him, not me, Dr. Pratt. It took him these studies in the laboratories with supercomputers, uh, making simulations to figure this out. And here people were recording it um, on rocks in ancient times, thousands and thousands of years mm -hmm. earlier. So getting back to Easter Island, we are looking at all the stuff from Easter Island that we can learn about, looking at the Rongo Rongo script, this undeciphered, previously uninterpreted script. And Katie says to me, they look like the petroglyphs that Dr. Peratt is studying. And I said, sure enough, it's the same things. It's the same configurations. But what you have with the script, the Rongo Rongo script, is them in sequence as if they were recording what was happening to the sun, one item after another. And that changed everything for me. I said, we've got to look at the sun. We've got to look at the sun as a causal factor. And the more I looked into this, the more I found that yes, the sun has incredible influence on earth. It can cause the comings and goings of ice ages once the conditions are right. Otherwise, it can cause earthquakes. I talk about that in the book. That yep. All these factors that tie in with the sun. It can cause the torrential rains that weather the Sphinx that I've been looking at for 30 years now. Yeah. You know, I want to take a short break. And when we come back, I want to talk to about a couple of these things you, you touched upon. I definitely want to talk about Turkey, but I, I wanted to get a sense. I can only imagine what it, it's like for you to be you for a moment. I have this... Uh, I have, I have this Dr. Shock envy in the moment of what it's like to be, oh, okay, the Sphinx. Oh, wait a minute. The paw of the Sphinx. Oh, my goodness. A discovery in there. And by the way, I know you're referring to your wife as Katie. It's Catherine, right? I know her as Catherine. Catherine you Brilliant listen. photography work and so much more and contributor to this book, by the way. Absolutely, um, absolutely. Just brilliant. What? I could not do it without her. Between you the make a great team. And I was reading even more about getting married on Easter Island and, and, and how both of you, right? Each of you individually is amazing. But when two people come together like that, there's such a greater purpose that they sign on to do together. When we come back, we're going to talk about that. What is it about what you're discovering in a lifetime of discoveries that help us connect the dots? And one last thing I want to say. How is it that something that's falling from the sky yesterday in Florida is making the headlines? How many of these fall from the sky? But what is it about this one that people could see? Why are we now more intrigued about the going ons of what we don't know in space and the history and the beauty of thousands of years on earth that calls many of us to ask more questions than answers. But if you are Dr. Robert Schock and you are sitting there and looking at the Sphinx and you are now discovering things that other people had not discovered, what is that like? We're gonna come back, we're gonna talk about why this approach or shall I say, this solar induced dark age, this this applying this framework to history is more than groundbreaking. That and we're going to share some tidbits maybe you don't know. Stay tuned, everybody. We'll be right back. What happens when you take two people that have a love, a dedication and a passion? for discovery and you put them together. What, what happens when these two people meet and not only get to understand each other, but get to take a wondrous journey together? And, you know, uh, when Robert, when you mentioned Katie, you know, Catherine is what I'm familiar with. I, I, I haven't, I haven't made it to the place where I can yet call her Katie, but 
when I think about the connection and what the journey you've taken together, um, I'm really struck by a number of different things. But I want to talk to you about solar induced dark age and that framework, because the book takes us on a journey so many different places. I mean, I would need about three or four hours to really ask you all the questions I want to ask you. But the most important thing is for us to understand what this framework means, not just to its literal meaning, but also the implications for discovery. Tell us about that. Well, the literal meaning, let's start there, is something we touched on before the break, which is that there was a cycle of civilization, that's my terminology for it. There was high civilization. There was advanced civilization 12,000 years ago before the end of the last ice age. And that was devastated by the solar outburst that brought the last ice age to an end. And I could go into great detail on what was happening there. But I think right now we want to talk about the major framework and the implications. Yeah. So this early civilization was devastated. We went into what I call a dark age, a solar induced dark age. And it's sort of ironic because the sun brings light. The sun is absolutely indispensable for us as humans, for all of life on earth, but it also has another side. It has a volatile side. And what we're finding now, what I believe is the case based on the astrophysics and analogies with other stars that we can study is that our sun is a fairly typical star in its class. And it probably goes through periods of disequilibrium is one way to look at it. Um, it has to recalibrate itself and it takes a couple of thousand years to do that. So you have these periods of a couple of thousand years when it's relatively unstable. And then you have periods in between eight to 10,000 years when it's relatively stable. So from the end of the last ice age, 9,700 BC up until just recently, it's been relatively stable. Um, it's now going to a pattern of instability once again, but we can come back to that. Let me get back to the solar induced dark age yeah. and implications. So we have about 6,000 years after the end of the last ice age, after the devastation of that early cycle of civilization, dark age slowly humanity came back. It was actually devastated in many areas. Other places, pockets of humanity survived. So for instance, we see this in what is modern Anatolia. Pockets survived there because they went underground to be um, very straightforward about yeah. it. We can even map languages from that region, the Indo-European languages going back to the end of the last ice age. So there's lots of data for this, but slowly humanity reemerged to the point where modern archeologists refer to civilization having originated, as I mentioned before, between 4,000 and 3,000 BC, but it's not the origin, it's a re-emergence. Oh. And even the ancient people 5,000 years ago, they knew this. They talked about how there had been an earlier cycle of civilization, what the Egyptians called Zeptepi. Um, the, the, uh, their predecessors, if you would, what they consider the gods who, which I interpret that as that was a advanced people. So very much like modern Europe, or when I say modern Europe, um, you know, the Renaissance after a dark age, after the fall of classical civilization, but a much grander time frame. Uh, so our cycle of civilization, as I measure it as a geologist, has lasted about 5,000 years. But we run the risk of doing this all again, that if we do not heed the sun, if we do not pay attention to natural um, events, particularly solar events, our sun is now ramping up once again. And furthermore, and I wanna be very positive about this, but sometimes to be positive, we have to face reality. We have to face the actual facts. And I think that's something that I've tried to do all my career is to use the actual evidence, face the actual facts. Our sun is not particularly stable. 
and it's going into a period of real instability now. We've seen this over the last six, 8,000 years. There's been a half a dozen um, periods of instability that we can now measure. They were relatively small compared to the end of the last ice age. I want to point out, this is really new data since yeah. the first edition of my book. When the first edition of my book yeah. I was doing this blindly, and now we have all this data coming forward that supports what I was saying all along. But we have also boxed ourselves in in many ways. We have wonderful technology. Look at what we're doing right now, you and I. Yeah. Even a small solar outburst could bring this down if we're yeah. not careful about it. And so we should not ignore what's going on with the sun. We should make plans well ahead of time as best we can. And we should also acknowledge, I believe, what is beyond our control. Um, which is also making plans in the sense of realizing what we can't control. Uh, you know, humanity, and I don't want to sound like I'm preaching, but there's incredible hubris on the part of humanity sometimes. And I think we need to acknowledge uh, our place in the bigger scheme. And this is something we can learn from that ancient cycle of civilization. So I think that this puts to for me a lot of pieces together not only why the earlier civilizations come and go in the biggest picture but also where what does the future look like where are we leading to how can we take this information and plan ahead you know what i'm struck by and this is what's fascinating as i'm reading your book and i'm thinking about how we port, how we portray the deities of ancient Egypt. And I think about this. And so when I start to look at timelines and listen to the discoveries and the new discoveries, I think about, and I've, I've often asked myself this question, you know, of course there have been civilizations that revere the sun, but none, I don't think quite like Egypt. Mm -hmm. And when I think about the sun god Ra and as you were speaking, all I could think about was, well, wait a minute. Yeah, there is this side of Ra, then there's this side. Yes, there's yeah. the light side, and then there's the dark side. And as you were speaking about the sun itself, I just started to, I, I've often wondered, boy, how do those people know? I mean, yep. they, there was a knowledge that had to be carried forward to them. Well, and, and see, I think one thing we can learn from the ancients, well, talk about the Egyptians. They saw the sun as divine. They saw the sun very much as God, literally God. Yep. And this is actually something that we find throughout ancient civilization. And where it's coming from, I believe, is that they actually believed the sun was in a way conscious. Um, and I don't use that term loosely, and there's actually evidence, I believe, for that. We're not necessarily talking consciousness the way we think of for humans, mm -hmm. but we're also not talking just totally inanimate, um, random matter, if I could put it that way. So they saw a connection to the divine, and they saw that the sun, if I could now use the consciousness and sort of anthropomorphic metaphor, I'll put it that yeah. way, has different personalities Those totally different periods the sun can be loving and supportive and brings forth humanity and supports humanity the sun also has another side when it can ravage humanity and you see this in the myths of ancient egypt i think better expressed than any other ancient tradition that has come down to us although you see it in other ancient traditions as well uh katie Catherine Ulysses, my wife, Katie and I went to India, for instance, there they revere the sun. The sun is a one manifestation, the physical manifestation of the ultimate God for them. And so again, they're acknowledging the same thing, the sun and the divine, and how important it is for humanity. You know, I'm really struck by a number of, of things, but you talked to some of this in the book and I kept going back. I, I, I went back to a couple of chapters in the book, but I went back and I want to go back there again. I want to go back to the Hall of Records, the chamber under the Sphinx. And I want to ask you, I know that this is a discovery um, with geophysicist uh, Thomas Dobecki. 
and, and and I know you you both of you together on that. But I wondered, I don't know when when I wondered this, but I wondered how that discovery altered the framework of all the other discoveries that were to come now. And what I'm trying to ask about it is there's a level of importance in that discovery that had it not been found, I just wonder. I wonder. The, the, the chamber under the Sphinx? Yeah. The chamber under the Sphinx is, uh, I mean, it's absolutely fascinating. Yeah. I'd like to get into it at some point. Yeah. It has uh, been something that has been part of my life ever since uh, yep. Tom, Becky and I discovered it 30 years ago now, uh, or just over 30 years ago. But it's interesting that I've not always, and maybe I've done this very consciously and purposefully, I've not always put as much emphasis on it in my own life, mm -hmm. maybe not always so, uh, uh, as other people have. So let me explain that a little bit. Yeah. I want to be clear that we were not looking for a chamber under right. things. Uh, we found that chamber. Edgar Casey, for instance, had suggested it would be there. We now have ancient evidence. And this is uh, work that um, I pursued with my colleague, Dr. Manu Saif today, that the ancient Egyptians in 5,000 years ago, about 3000 BC, were apparently aware of that chamber. And furthermore, the Sphinx was not a Sphinx at that time. Right. It was a lioness. It was a female lion um, known as Mehit or Mehet. Uh, that guarded a chamber. Literally, we now have documents from 5,000 years ago that talk about a much more ancient chamber, which I believe they were tying in with Zeptepe, so back to the end of the last ice age, the same time that Plato's talking about Atlantis. So that chamber in some ways is key and core and ties many things together. But getting back to my first comment, yeah. I was not looking for a chamber, right. I was not treasure hunting whatsoever. And I have, um, what, what I wanted to do with the seismic work was to look at the subsurface weathering, the subsurface mineralogical changes that would give me a handle on the age of the Sphinx, because I went independent evidence uh, for what I was saying based on surface analysis. So I wanted another data set, independent data set, essentially. And it was just by circumstance that we found chambers and actually there's a collapsed tunnel, et cetera. Uh, and that just attracted so much attention, rightfully so, but it's it's something I, how do I want to say, metaphorically fell into. Now, I'd like no to kidding. I wasn't looking for pyrite either. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> it's exactly. one of the passing grade from that class. But yeah, you, you know, for some reason, gold just stuck out to me or the, <laughs> the looks of gold. You know, I want to get back to one other thing in this book, and, and it is the implications of the solar induced dark age and the implications for connecting the dots to so many other things because you know we've talked about it in its own in itself in its own realm what it is but there are implications to applying the framework right and you talk about this in the book and you connect the dots to you know, megalithic monuments and traditions. And, you know, it's so fascinating to me. I got to, I worked for Bell Labs. Mm -hmm. I got to have bagels every Friday with Arno Penzias. Wonderful. And I was, a, I was a young kid. So as a young kid, you can imagine the most ridiculous questions you want to ask a, a, a gentleman like that, not mm -hmm. knowing really who this guy is. Like big bang, so what? And I remember spending Fridays with him in total awe. And he was so open to us. And he bought the bagels, by the way. That's great. And, and I always remember how he connected the dots. And that's really my question for you. There are a lot of dots that just do not connect. Yeah, it, it seems like you found a way to do that. I, I agree. And I think that's a very interesting analogy with the microwave background radiation that he discovered, which then tied things together cosmologically. Yep. 
what is now known as the Big Bang. And <laughs> I love that analogy. And I, I feel flattered and honored because I think in some ways the concept of the solar induced dark yep. age, the sun has been the modulating factor on cycles of civilization all of a sudden really brings things together. Why do we have only megalithic, huge megalithic structure surviving from that earlier period? That's all that would survive. Um, getting to the chamber that we were just talking about, that's another way to try to deposit and allow things to survive. So if we could ever get into that chamber and find its contents, they could actually go back to oh, the man. earlier cycle of civilization. Uh, we have a site at Gunan Padang in Java that also has a chamber inside um, that may contain records. But so what do you do to survive this? You build megalithic structures that will survive. You try to cover over material when you see what's happening. So Gebekli Tepe was purposefully covered yep. um, to protect it. Uh, you, you built chambers into solid rock to protect your archives. You survive personally by going into first natural caves and then carving into the rock. What do we have in Anatolia and Cappadocia in Turkey, the underground cities? They were not building these underground cities um, to survive from uh, you know, their enemies. I mean, their enemies no. would just block it in and they'd all die and suffocate. Furthermore, yes, and this is a very important point I want to make. Yes, many of these structures were used later. They were used during the last 5,000 years. Yeah. They were a legacy, I believe, from that earlier cycle of civilization. So the Sphinx, which I've spent so much time studying, there is no doubt that the ancient Egyptians from 5,000 uh, 5, years ago, 3,000 BC on, the dynastic Egyptians, they knew the Sphinx, they worshiped the Sphinx, they restored the Sphinx, they recarved the head of the Sphinx from a lioness to the modern, when I say modern, the 5,000 year exactly. old. Exactly. Yeah. Now, you remember I'm a geologist. Yeah, that's no, um, I'm totally right there with you. Yeah. I mean, I'm on the same page of you so much that when people say primitive civilizations, the hair on my neck just stands up because of the very thing you just, and you could probably go on. But how is a civilization primitive when it knows how to cover over a structure, when it knows how to protect information? I mean, where is the primitive nature of that? So my, the hair on my neck just goes bizarro because it shuts us out to learn something. And I think we better learn some things. That's right. That's right. That's right. And we better use their example of what yeah. they they, they set the stage. One thing I, I want to make this point, sure. maybe I've already made. Go but ahead. I think something that really distinguishes those classic ancient civilizations from our civilization is their concept of time and their time frame. They did not think in the next three years or the next election cycle. They really had a good perspective on the big picture temporally as well as cosmologically. Um, and I think that's something that's mm -hmm. very important that we can learn from them. I totally agree with you. I remember one of the questions that I asked Dr. Penzias and gosh, what was I, 17, 18? I don't even know how, I was like in that realm. And I asked him the question, did time stand still? Mm. Why did I, maybe I watched the time machine or something that came out, but I asked him that question because I was listening to him and the way he very, look, he talked to us in, layperson language that we could understand. And what, what dawned on me was I couldn't comprehend the amount of time he was talking about. Mm. So in my mind, it was almost as if time stood still or there was no time. And could we benefit from that, Dr. Shock? And what I mean by that is we live so in the election cycle, the annual cycle, the financial cycle, the tax cycle, I mean, my gosh, we look at ourselves as, as so minuscule without the impact of what we could have on the future. Yeah, no, I think we could benefit a lot. And I think this is one of the um, 
how should I say, weakest points in our society today yep. is that we don't have a concept of any type of long-term, even short-term time frame. Look at all the things that have happened, and I don't want to blame anyone or point to certain things, but we could. Um, you know, where you have quote natural disasters, but they're not natural disasters at all from a geological point yeah. of view. There are things that happen on a regular basis. Uh, I'll use a quick example. When I was a um, geology student and just learning about this, and this impressed me, and I've never forgotten it. I remember learning in geology about 50-year floodplains, 100-year floodplains, et cetera. And then watching the news, it just happened to be, it was a horrible thing where all these houses and homes have been destroyed because of flooding and the reporters there and saying, this hasn't happened for a hundred years as if it should never happen if it doesn't happen. And he was standing, and I just learned this as a geologist, right in the middle of a hundred year floodplain. Yes. It happened exactly on time from a yeah. nature's point of view, yet humans don't you know, 100 years is a long time from a modern point of view. I think the ancients have very, very different perspective. They, they could plan things, they could build things that they might not see the uh, completion in their lifetime, yet they still knew it was important. They kept records over enormously long periods of time. Um, they uh, learned from those experiences. They looked at the sun and recorded things, et cetera. Uh, much more sophisticated in that way than we yeah. are, I would say. Yeah, I recently started to take a look back at some of my family, um, the Italian part of my family, not the newly discovered Brazilian part of my family. And I just started to look and I got fascinated again with Nero. And many people characterize Nero as a crazy guy, you know, just crazy this, crazy that, but we're discovering new things about Nero. And I've often thought about, oh, wait a minute. Why was it he built what he built? Did he have a sense of time? Did he think I'm building it for me that I'm never gonna die? And I've thought about civilizations that just don't think like we think. Yeah. Right. They yep. look, they wanna create, this, how should I say it, this mark that you can build upon as if cultures will continue and will yeah. learn from each other. And I wanted to ask you this last question. I know this hour has gone very fast. First, how do people get a copy of this fabulous book? And also, how do they find out about you? Okay, so uh, find out about me, they can go to my website, which Catherine Ulysses Katie um, designed and maintains. I want to give her credit for that. Uh, <laughs> it's Robert Schock, R-O-B-E-R-T-S-C-H-O-C-H.com. So robertschock.com. And again, because people misspell my name all the time, R-O-B-E-R-T-S-C-H-O-C-H. Dot com. And from there, there are links to the book, uh, Forgotten Civilization, uh, the second edition, the new edition, if, or if people want to have both editions, I think there's still, it's still available in the first edition too. Uh, but the second edition is what people should be looking for. And there are links to Barnes and Noble and Amazon, et cetera, from my website. So I think that's the best way to think about that or to get yeah. a copy. That I would encourage people to not, and I want to be clear, I'm not trying to sell books here. I'm trying to disseminate information. Because oh, I yeah. I mean, I want to be really clear too. Uh, it, it, um, this is a book. However, it's way more than a book. And, you. you know, it is really, for me, somebody that doesn't know a whole lot, but is absolutely fascinated. This truly does connect a lot of dots. And I think sometimes, Robert, that we live in a gap, right, where we used to be curious enough to want to connect the dots. But in this fast paced world that we're in, and it is fast paced, because we don't even remember what we had for breakfast, or whether we even had it. Um, we are now, I think, starting to see a new fascination. And I wanted to ask you this question. I know I've got about five minutes left. As you think about solar-induced dark age, as you think about this framework, what excites you most 
about your future journey and discoveries? You don't have to reveal any secrets, but I just want to get a sense. Well, I, you know, I'm on this journey. I'm continuing on this journey. I did not know where it would lead, and I still don't know ultimately where it will lead. But uh, I think that something that's very important for me personally, and I believe it, many people could benefit from this, is tying with what you were saying, not being so past fate. I can't talk now. So <laughs> that's paced. We need to be able yeah. to step back. We need to be able to reflect. We need to be able to think about things and integrate things. It should not always just be click, click here, there, and then jumping on to the next thing. I really think it's important to sit down and ponder and think about things. And I think this is something we can learn from the ancients also to really, for me, peace in understanding the bigger picture, how things fit together. So part of my journey has always been, how do all the little pieces fit together? And I can't help but think of a physical, I just want to mention this, if I may. Sure. Gebekli Tepe, this site yes. in southeastern Turkey. It was devastated at the end of the last ice age. What we have there is a number of uh, stone circles, they're called, and they have wonderful pillars that are beautifully carved. They have writing on them. People can read about this in the book. I believe it's true writing. They were literate. And you can see how they were snapped and broken during the end of the last ice age, during the devastating times, um, the earthquakes that would have been induced by the sun. And I talk about this again in the book without going into detail here. And they did their best to try to piece it together quickly and put it put up crude stone walls to hold it together and position everything the right way because it records information. And then they covered it over purposefully. They spent a lot of time and energy covering it to protect it like a time capsule. So it was important to them to maintain it, to preserve it, Maybe they wanted to go back and uncover it. I don't know. But certainly, I believe they thought it was important enough information to pass on to future generations. Again, they were not thinking in the short term. They were thinking beyond themselves. Uh, they were reflecting and thinking beyond their own lifetimes, beyond maybe even their own culture and civilization. Um, to pass on a legacy. And I think that's so important, but so many people, again, I come back to the theme that so many people today, I feel in our society, they're encouraged to have a very short-term view of things, yeah. not, not, yeah. not looking at the bigger picture. You know what I love about not just that story, but many stories like it, here's what I love about it. Somehow they knew, even on the brink of what they saw as disaster. Mm -hmm. I mean, they wouldn't have gone through that trouble if they thought, oh, we're going to be OK. Right. Not really. But somehow they knew that humanity would survive. That sometime down the road, some way, somehow, this would be a discovery for the ages. And I've often thought about that. How did they know? Yeah, how did they know? But it's how did they know? And also having that confidence. Confidence, yes. That, that yes, you do do things for the long term. Yep. Um, that there is something more important than, you know, any individual, if I could put it that way. Not that we're not all important in our own right, uh, but having the confidence that there is a bigger picture and that we can collectively contribute to it. Wow. Robert, thank you so much for today. Again, please give out your website. And last question, I'd like to know your personal message, what you'd like to leave us with today. Uh, personal message. Well, let's start with the website, www. I guess I don't need to say that. that my students say I don't need to say that. <laughs> um, Robert Schock, R-O-B-E-R-T-S-C-H-O-C-H.com. And maybe my personal message is that I think about, I, Katie, Catherine, you let's see my wife, Katie and I always think about the, what we call the ancestors, those that came before us. And um, 
I think that we should try to do the ancestors proud, if I could put it that way, that we should do, um, we should acknowledge them, we should thank them for what they've given us, and that we should try to uh, continue uh, with the good precedence and legacy that they've set for us. Mm. I want to thank you both. I mean, I want to thank you. And for those of you out there, just so you know, I want to make sure you get a copy of this book. I I touched upon a few things in here. I did not get to Ezekiel's vision, but maybe I'll have to talk about that separately. Um, thank you so much, Robert. Thank you, Catherine, even though I know you're not on air here, but I know you're there, there. I want to thank all of you for tuning us in. And this is so interesting that I am sure you're going to want to know more about not just what Robert is talking about here, but what are the dots that are now being connected? And can you sit in awe? Let's take a short break, everyone. We'll be right back. Mm -hmm.